find your Bible and open to Psalm 102 in your copy of God's Word. I hope that you brought a Bible with you today. You know that's our textbook. Each and every Sunday we're in the Word of God. If you don't have a Bible, uh, there's one in front of you in the seat. And uh, if you don't own one, you can take that one. Uh, It's our gift to you. It is the translation that I preach out of. I preach out of the English Standard Version. And so if you find in the Bible, Psalm 102, and I want to talk to you this morning about this idea of principles for the new year. Principles for the new year. Psalm 102, verses 18 through 22. Drew Houston's the founder of a company called Dropbox. Many of you may use Dropbox to store Uh, files and pictures online and then share with others. As the founder of Dropbox, he gave a 2013 commencement speech at MIT. And he told the graduates, he said this, When I think about it, the happiest and most successful people I know don't just love what they do. They're obsessed with solving an important problem, something that matters to them. And then he said something very interesting. They remind me of a dog chasing a tennis ball. Their eyes go a little crazy, the leash snaps, and they go bounding out off, plowing through whatever gets in their way. So it's not about pushing yourself, it's about finding the tennis ball, that thing that pulls you. And then he said to the graduates, so what's your tennis ball? I think he's on to something when it comes to life, when it comes to ministry. What captures your heart? What captures your imagination? What will it be that drives you in your life? What will it be that drives our church and our people? Whatever you fall in love with that gives you passion, what matters to you most? What drives you to get out of bed in the morning and to accomplish the goals that you've set before you? What are you, what are you passionate about? As believers, as a faith family, we're passionate about seeing God change lives through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're passionate about the Word of God. I reminded you just last Sunday about our values. We're passionate about truth, about love, about prayer, about worship, about impact, and about people. These are biblical ideas that drive everything we do. If you'll imagine, they're the headwaters that then form the rivers and the channels where we go, where everything flows from our values and our calling. So what should a people of faith The church of God. Those that believe these values, what should we do and how should we operate? What should it look like? What's our purpose? Why are we here? Those are important questions for us to ask and answer and to consider at an appropriate time right now in the new year. You know, casting a vision for the church is always a daunting task. Try to predict what your life will look like one month from now or one year from now one decade from now, or one generation from now. We can make our plans, and we can think we know how it's going to turn out, but I would imagine if you look back over 2018 and years past, you might say that things did not quite go according to the way you had planned. Maybe, just maybe, things turned out a little differently than expected. Casting a vision for the church is... Sometimes a daunting task. It can be a challenge. I could not imagine all that God would do in the last seven years when I came to be your pastor seven years ago. When I came, I told you what our priorities would be. We want to see lives changed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the glory of God. That's what we're about. And any church that exists based on the New Testament model is a church that should say we want to see lives changed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God. How do you paint a picture? How do you cast vision for something like that? What is vision anyway? Vision is a preferred picture of the future that produces passion in people. I'm going to say that again. Vision is a preferred picture of the future that produces passion in people. And God has given me an overwhelming vision for Second Baptist Church. God has placed before us more than we could ever expect, more than we could ever dream of, and more than we believe we can accomplish on our own. God has given us a vision that is really a God-sized vision. God has given me a great love and passion for you, His people here at Second Baptist Church, for this ministry, what He's called us to do, for this community. We can change the world from Warner Robins, Georgia, and we desire to go to the next level in ministry, in impact, and in making a difference. 
A vision for the future can be daunting, sometimes fuzzy, but there are a few things I know for sure. God's word will not change. We stand on his word. God's purpose for the church will not change. We're called to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who need to hear. God's plans will not change. He is a God who has a definite plan for you, for me, and for his church. And people will not change. What does that mean, Pastor? People change all the time. Well, I'll tell you this. The greatest need of every person on the planet is that they need Jesus. And that never changes. So we need to plan, we need to pray, we need to prepare, we need to plant, we need to ask God to work. And Psalm 102 verses 18 to 22 give us some principles as we seek to move forward in faith to the glory of God. Psalm chapter 102, begin reading with me in verse 18. Let this be recorded for a generation to come, so that a people not yet to be created may praise the Lord. That he looked down from his holy height from heaven, the Lord looked at the earth to hear the groans of the prisoners, to set free those who were doomed to die, that they may declare in Zion the name of the Lord and in Jerusalem his praise when peoples gather together and kingdoms to worship the Lord. Remember the powers in the perfect word of God. Let this be recorded for a generation to come. So that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. Talk about vision. Forward looking. Forward thinking. Wondering what is life going to be like not just in my generation but for generations to come. I believe we see several principles here for any time of the year. Especially this time of the new year. Number one, focus on the future not the past. Listen to me. Focus on the future, not the past. This verse absolutely blew me away as I was studying during my personal quiet time. That phrase, that idea in verse 18. Let this be recorded for a generation to come so that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. Yet those that are not yet born look back at our time, at this moment, at our church, at our decisions... And our willingness to follow God in faith and let them say generations from now that what they did matters to me now because I am where I am today because of their decisions to follow the Lord. The reality is that all of us are where we are today because other people that came before us made decisions. We're here in this moment, at this place, in this building. Off of Moody Road, in Warner Robins, Georgia, on January 6th, 2019. And we're here because others who came before us made decisions that brought us to this moment. Yes, we make decisions and we decide to take steps, but ultimately there's no way we'd be here if others had not sacrificed, if others had not given, if others had not taken steps of faith. I want to live for something that outlasts me. I want my vision to be greater than just the next moment of my life or the next thrill or the next paycheck. I want to live for something that's greater than me, that impacts all of eternity. And here the psalmist says, write this down. Let this be recorded so that generations from now they will see we were faithful to God. Look at what he says. Write it down so that one day people who aren't yet born will know that when it came our time to be people of faith and to walk in faith and to trust the Lord and to make an impact, we chose to follow the Lord. That's powerful. Notice this phrase, for a generation to come. A generation to come. The author is focusing on the future, not the past. This psalm is most likely written by David. And I want you to understand, this psalm, for the most part, describes a difficult time in his life. Look at what he says in verse 1 and 2. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. Don't hide your face from me. How does he describe his moment? In the day of my distress, incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily when I call. Do you see that? 
David describes where he's at right now as a time of distress. In my difficulty, don't abandon me, God. And sometimes that's the way we feel in moments of difficulty. God does not abandon us, but we feel as if we've been abandoned in difficult circumstances or situations. But here, David says, in the midst of my difficulty, I'm going to praise you and I'm going to trust you. But the author is not focused on the present. He's not focused on what he's going through right now. He's not focused on his distress. What's he focused on? Look at verses 15 to 17. Nations will fear the name of the Lord. All the kings of the earth will fear your glory. For the Lord builds up Zion. He appears in his glory. He regards the prayer of the destitute and does not despise their prayer. What's he saying? I'm in the midst of a difficult time and circumstance, but I know that one day every nation, every tribe, every tongue will bow and say, the Lord God is king of all. That's why we're here. That even in the midst of difficulty and struggles, hardship, that we can still say, God, you get the glory from it all. One of the reasons we ought not to focus on the past is that sometimes the past was so good, we want to go back. Sometimes, and if you're like me, you can be a little bit nostalgic at times. Sometimes we play up the past in our mind. And we think, man, those were the the good old days. We hear phrases about the good old days. I'm like, how far back do you want to go? Would you like to go back before central heat and air? I would suggest that that would not be very good. Maybe we could go back before the smartphone. That might be best for everybody. What what were the good old days? And the reality is, if you're like me, we can play that up in our minds. And we, Man, if, if it was just like it used to be, if it was just like it. Look, listen to me carefully. God has us here and now on purpose, not by accident. And so we can, we can long for the past as much as we want. But how does that make us effective in the future or powerful in the present? Uh, another reason that it's bad to focus on the past, like we, we look back and maybe, maybe we, we make it out to be even greater than it was, or maybe the past was really, really hard. Maybe 2018 just wasn't your year. Might have been one of the most difficult years for you in your life. In fact, you're... St- Still walking through some of that and trying to figure it out. Just because the calendar changes years, it doesn't mean everything changes automatically. And so maybe the last year or more, you've just been struggling and thinking and wondering. And you don't know what God's up to and you feel like he's absent. And this has been the hardest time for you. Listen to me carefully. One of the reasons we can't dwell in the past is because sometimes we build it up and make it so great. But another reason is if there's pain in the past and we don't get past it, that hurts our effectiveness in the present and our witness in the future. Have you ever met somebody that has a hurt in the past that they were never able to get beyond? If you're not careful, you'll become jaded, angry, and bitter. The psalmist here says, in my distress, I still trust and know that God is good. And I'm going to write this down, that even in my darkest moment, even in the most difficult, destitute time of my life, I'm going to write this down so a generation to come will know that God is good and He deserves our praise and our worship. Someone said, there's nothing like a dream to create the future. Wayne Calloway is a former CEO of Pepsi Company. If he were here, I would tell him that Coca-Cola is way better. Here's what he said. Listen to this. You should have more dreams than memories. Can I say that again? You should have more dreams than memories. If you don't, you're in trouble. I would say that is true for individuals, no matter how old you are. And I would say that's also true for a church. I think... God, for the history of Second Baptist Church, we are standing on the shoulders of giants, of legends, those that have gone before us who now are in heaven in the presence of the Lord. I thank God for our history, but when our memories outweigh our dreams and our vision, we are in danger as a church, as a people, as individuals. God continues to lead us into what he has for us. Number one, focus on the future, not the past. God is still up to something, and I want to be about that. Number two, 
Stay desperate for God's presence and power. Stay desperate for God's presence and power. In this last year, especially, I have grown more desperate for the presence and power of God in my life. I have known what it feels like to rely on my own strength. You get tired and you realize how weak you are. Maybe I'm not the only one that's been there and done that. We probably all have that t-shirt. I know what it's like to try to rely on my own strength and my own power and to feel weak and burnt out and frustrated. I'm reminded of how desperate we are for the presence of the Lord. I believe 2019 can be one of the best years of ministry that Second Baptist Church has ever seen. My prayer is that God would bless in such a way that when we look, at what he's doing at our church. There's no human explanation. And what others say, what is God doing at 2504 Moody Road on a hill in the middle of Houston County? What is happening? There's no explanation. It is only a move and of the power and the blessing of the Holy Spirit of God. God has blessed us, but the reality is we grow accustomed to the blessings of God. We get used to it, and we come to expect it. Listen to me carefully. God's hand of anointing and blessing doesn't show up everywhere. And when it's here, we better be grateful, we better be thankful, and we better stay desperate and hungry for it. We're desperate for His power and His presence. The psalmist says here, the Lord looks down from heaven. He hears the groans of those that are desperate for Him. We need to be desperate for God to move in our lives, in our church. When's the last time you personally got on your knees and said, God, I just can't take another step, another breath, make another decision. I can't do anything without you. When's the last time you realized that, when you expressed that? When's the last time our church... God, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And wherever you lead, that's what we want. That's what he says, verse 19, verse 20. He looked down from his holy height. From heaven the Lord looked at the earth to hear the groans of the prisoners, to set free those who were doomed to die. That's a powerful picture of the gospel, is it not? That he looked down and saw our desperate situation, how we were doomed by sin, and sin is one and only son, so that we might be rescued and redeemed from the pit of destruction. He saw those that were doomed to die. The Lord looked down from his holy height, from heaven, he looked to earth. God loves to work in the lives of people who are desperate to see him move. Until we want him to move more than our own comfort, more than our own convenience, we'll only experience a small part of what he wants to do. The reality is, at times, in my life, in your life, and in the life of the church, we settle for only a sample of what God wants us to do. You ever been to uh, Sam's or Costco, or even Publix? If you can go to Sam's, Costco, Publix, and you can walk around... And you can pick up some samples. Some of you go just for the samples. Some of you husbands, your wife says, hey, I'm going to Sam's. I'll tag along, right? She fills up the cart and you just make circles around the whole place. You know, you can get the sample. You know why they do that, right? They give you a sample. They want you to buy the whole thing, right? I've known people that skip lunch and just go get samples, Publix or places. They just keep handing them out. They don't make you take a number or you know, sign for it. The reality is that, that in our lives as a church, as people, sometimes we settle for samples. Listen to me carefully. Sometimes we settle for only a sample of what God wants to do. Sometimes God is more willing to work, to send revival, to revitalize, to to show grace and mercy. God's more willing to work than we are to allow Him to work. And so we settle for a sample of grace and a sample of His presence and a sample of His power, a sample of His anointing, a sample of church, a sample of worship, and we settle for samples when God says, I want to give you the whole thing. I want to provide for you everything you need. We just keep doing circles. 
taking a little bit here and a little bit there. I want you to understand, he's not just a sample God. He provides everything that we need, everything pertaining to life and godliness. We find in him. One of the problems with church in the United States is that we become so program-driven, process-driven, even people-driven, that we're no longer presence-driven, driven by the power and the presence of Almighty God. Man, you can plan a service and you can get the lights right and the music right. You can hire the best speaker. He can say the greatest, latest quotes. You can get the best video, the smoke and the lights and the mirrors and the orchestra, the choir. Anything you want, you imagine it, you dream it. But if, it's, if it does not have the power, the presence and the anointing of God, it does not matter. That's it. What we need most is the power and the presence of God. Desperate. It's a good word. Desperate. There's power in presence. Focus on the future, not the past. Stay, stay desperate for the presence and power of God. And number three, give God the glory He deserves. While I'm grateful to pastor here for seven years, and I'm thankful for your kindness and your recognition. You do know, and I've said this before, and I'll continue to say it, the only superstar here at Second Baptist Church is Jesus Christ. There's, there's no personality, there's no staff member, there's no deacon or life group leader. There's no one that rivals Jesus. He deserves the honor, He deserves the glory, He deserves the praise. Everything we do should be to follow Him and to give Him the glory He deserves. Look at verse 20 through 22. He heard the groans of the prisoners and set free those that were doomed to die. Look at this now, why? That they may declare in Zion the name of the Lord and in Jerusalem His praise. When peoples gather together and kingdoms to worship the Lord. What is all of this about? All of this is about the honor and the praise and the worship that's due to God alone. That's what this is about. That he deserves the glory and the praise. I want you to understand. We're going to look at Psalm 79, a couple of verses here in just a second. But I want to ask you a question and I want you to think about this. Don't answer out loud. Why did God save you? If you're here today and you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, there's been a time in your life you've repented of your sin, and you've placed your faith and trust in Christ. So if you're here, and you are saved, you know that you're going to heaven, that's a question I want you to think about. Why did God save you? And you say, this is what most of us in the American church say very first, God saved me because He loved me. And I would say you are absolutely right. That's true, but that's only part of it. You know that? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Man, we totally believe that. God saved me because he loved me. Jesus died on the cross so that I could be saved because he loved me and showed me grace. But I want to read to you Psalm chapter 79, verse 8 and 9, and I want you to hear these words. It'll be on your screen. You can turn a few pages back. God saved me because he loved me. Absolutely he did. But there's another reason the two go together. Do not remember against us our former iniquities. Let your compassion come speedily to meet us, for, for we are brought very low. Look at this. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name. Deliver us and atone for our sins. Why? For your name's sake. Listen to me carefully. To understand salvation holistically and not only from man's point of view, you've got to understand it in this way. God saved you because he loved you and God saved you so that he would receive glory from your life. Hello. That's not just man-centered salvation. That's God-centered salvation. He saved you, yes, because he loved you. He died for you because he loved you. But he also saved you so that he might receive glory. So when people look at you, they say, they're not that good. They're not that smart. They're not that moral. My goodness, it must be Jesus. 
Our lives ought to be walking, living, breathing advertisements for the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ought to bring Him glory. That's why we're saved. What does it say? Not just for us, but for His name's sake. God deserves the glory for what He's done. I truly believe as a church, as a ministry, as a people, our best days are ahead of us, not behind us. We look out the windshield, not the rearview mirror. God has incredible things in store. So what is the vision? Our mission doesn't change. Every New Testament church has the same mission. It is the Great Commission to make disciples of all people, to take the gospel to all nations. Our process will not change. We encourage you to connect, to grow, to serve, to be to faithful in worship both publicly and individually, to grow in a life group, a discipleship group, to serve in ministry and mission within the church and beyond the church. Our theme for the next year, the word faith. Faith. We're talking about unstoppable faith. We're talking about breakthrough faith. For the next 40 days, starting January 13th, we're going to be talking about faith. What does it mean to walk in faith? As I begun our brand new reading plan for 2019, we're already halfway through Genesis. And I'm reminded of the people who walked by faith. And so when you leave today, if you haven't already, make sure to grab a devotion. Make sure to grab a Bible reading plan. We're going to be 40 days in life groups, in church, individually, in our devotions, praying that we would be a people of faith. I want you to go ahead and mark down January 2020 as well. Like, Pastor, wait a second. We just got started with 2019. I understand. Your bulletin has one word on the front of it, momentum. January 2020, that's going to be our word. Dave Ramsey and people at Financial Peace University have a church-wide movement called Momentum where all of us come together as the people of God for the first 10 weeks of 2020 and focus on how we can be debt-free, how we can use our resources to impact the kingdom of God, how we can help our families in the church become debt-free, no longer enslaved to debt. And so 2020, momentum, it's coming. 52 weeks from now, our entire church will embark upon a journey unlike anything we've ever experienced. A journey that will focus on helping individual families. And I want you to hear me carefully. This is not a giving campaign. It's not something where we're asking you to sign up and pledge. We want to help you as the church. If the statistics are right, the vast majority of people that sit in here every single Sunday are drowning in debt. So how can we help you get debt free and live kingdom minded for the glory of God? Momentum 2020 is coming. We'll continue to go beyond the walls of the church to reach out to those that need Christ. Can I ask you a question? I want you to think about this. In 2018, who did you invite to come to church with you? Who did you ask? Who did you share the gospel with? Who did you reach? Who did you lead to Christ? If that's why we're on this earth, then we better get about our business. If that's why we're here then we better be about the Father's business. I want to encourage you to identify those who need Christ. Invest in their lives. Invite them to church with you and introduce them to Jesus. Identify, invest, invite, introduce. I want to encourage you to do that. Stats say that 82% of unchurched people are receptive to going to church if they're invited and escorted by a friend. 21% of church going Christians invited somebody last year. Do you see the problem? Do you see the problem? You say, well, pastor, everybody I know goes to church. If that's true about you, then I want to encourage you to make some lost friends. Say, wait a second. Now, what are you telling me? I'm telling you that if you're saved and you don't know anybody lost, if the Son of Man came to seek and save those that were lost and we're called to follow his example, we better be seeking out those that are lost and bringing them to Jesus. Go find them. I see in the near future a full pastoral staff at Second Baptist Church. We've been in transition for almost the entirety of 2018. A student pastor is on his way, Clark and Aaron Whitney. This is their last Sunday in Arkansas today. You be in prayer for them. It's a bittersweet time. They'll be with us on the 20th. Search team is working overtime 
I mean, we're working hard, our worship pastor search team, to find the next worship pastor. I want to publicly thank Jack Stark and uh, his ministry to us in our interim time leading our worship. And I want you to know today, Jack and I talked. Jack was in Texas last Sunday, and uh, he's been offered and accepted a full-time worship pastor position in Fort Worth, Texas. Next Sunday is his last Sunday with us. I want you to let him know how grateful we are for him and his ministry here. How proud we are of you, buddy. Thank you. When Jack came to serve in an interim role with us, we said, Jack, we want to be a blessing to you and we want you to be a blessing to us. And I know for a fact that he's been a blessing to us in so many ways. And we're going to be praying for you as you head to Fort Worth. In this coming year, we'll begin to develop our property on Highway 96 with the money that we've raised without incurring more debt. Do you hear me? As we develop the property on 96 with the money we've raised without incurring more debt, can I just tell you how good and faithful God is? Can I tell you that? We're talking about all the things that we believe God wants to do, and we're thinking and praying, how are we going to do this? How much is it going to cost? And how are we going to afford all this? And the answers are sometimes we don't exactly know all the details. But can I just tell you, even in my mind, as I begin to say, God, I believe you've put all of this on our heart. I believe these are steps that you want us to take. I don't see how it's going to happen. I don't know how it all works out. And even in some of my doubts and questions, God answers resoundingly, trust me, follow me. And I had no idea that the last day of 2018, somebody would show up at my office at Second Baptist Church with a check for $1 million. Is God good or is he good? Is he faithful? God is good and he is faithful. Now I want you to know and I want you to understand, I wasn't praying that God would deliver a check for a million dollars to Second Baptist Church. If he wants to do that every week, fine by me. And I'm not saying that that answers all of our questions, but I'm saying to me, as a follower of Jesus Christ, God is saying, I've got it covered. You follow me faithfully and watch me work. Our staff for the most part, didn't even know that. Surprise, guys. I was saving that one for this morning. Can I tell you this? I do believe that multi-site and multi-campuses will be a part of our future. I, I know that right now there are so many questions surrounding Rehoboth Baptist Church, the debt they have. So many questions surrounding, is this the step that we're supposed to take over these next several months? God has placed this on my heart, so I'm not saying that I know for certain this is a step that we are going to take as a church at this time. But I do believe it's something God's put on my heart, whether it's this time or whether it's not. Do you know several decades ago, Second Baptist Church was starting churches all over Warner Robins? Do you know that? You know, several decades ago, there are multiple churches in our community that are in existence today because Second Baptist Church sent out people and resources, spent time and money. And so what we're doing, as God put everything together, I had no idea that we just needed to step back and press pause and pray about this opportunity. But a year or more ago, we'd planned to begin 40 days of faith and really spend some extra time in prayer over this. And so that's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to pray. We'll continue to be a great commission church. Acts 1-8 gives us the model. We're going to continue to impact those that are right here and those that are around the world, those that are across the street and across the globe. We'll continue to engage in church planning and missions in North America and around the world. Think of the places that we have had an impact because of your faithful giving. Think of places like Los Angeles, California, Worcester, Massachusetts. Think of places like Portland, Oregon, Vancouver, B.C., Canada, the Ukraine, Brazil, Kenya, Peru, all over the place and beyond. God has been so good. We'll continue to grow as a church as we reach the potential that he has called us to reach. He's worth it. Someone said there are three kinds of people in the world. Those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who say, what?
happen. Can I tell you this morning, churches are the same way. You hear that? We need to be, we need to be the kind of church that with God's power makes things happen. We need to be the kind of church that affects change in our community, reach the lost, the light in the darkness. Let me bring all the way back to the story that I had in the beginning. If you can remember all the way back, this is a longer sermon for me. You're welcome. Happy 2019. What's that tennis ball? Right? What's the one thing that we say as a church that matters most? What are we chasing that nothing can hold us back? Can I tell you what it is? Life change. We want to see lives changed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God. That's what it is. What does that mean? It means the lost are saved. The saved are discipled. Those discipled are sent. It means lives are changed for the glory of God. It means marriages are restored and wayward children come home. It means addicts are set free and those that, that are in chains, those chains are broken. It means the waters of baptism stirred and people being saved, sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ. A church that shares its faith and goes and reaches those that need Jesus Christ. We are about seeing lives changed changed for the glory of God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our tennis ball. That's what we chase. That's what it means. God wants to use you and he wants to use me to see that happen. I don't think it's too much to ask. I don't think it's too much to pray for or to dream about to say, God, would 2019 and beyond be the best years of ministry that this church has ever seen? I don't want to have more memories than I have vision and dreams for what God wants to do in my life personally, in my family, and in this church. And I believe through the power of God, the Holy Spirit of God, His presence and anointing, our future is brighter than ever as we seek to follow what he has in store for us. Mark this down. Write it down today so that generations from now will read. This was the moment we said we will not step aside and we will not step back. We will listen to the call of God and press forward to what he's asking us to do. Write it down so that generations will see this is the moment that we say, God, we want everything that you have for us. We want your will Nothing less, nothing more, nothing else. He is worth it.